We are glad to have you back on the God's Light channel. Researchers recently uncovered surprising information. Pontius Pilate, the Roman official known for ordering Jesus' crucifixion, disclosed secrets about Jesus before his death. These revelations challenge our understanding of Jesus as the Son of God. Pilate, a figure deeply entwined with Jesus' fate, harbored undisclosed details about him until his dying day. What exactly did he reveal? Could there have been a scandal linking them? Join us as we delve into the shocking details of Pontius Pilate's letter shared about Jesus. Number 1. The Intriguing Trial of Jesus Pontius Pilate was the fifth leader appointed by the Roman Empire to oversee the region of Judea. He held this role during the time of Emperor Tiberius. From about 26 to 37 AD, Pilate is most famously known for being the judge during Jesus' trial and for ultimately deciding to have him crucified. His role in the Christian faith is significant, mentioned in both the Apostles and Nicene creeds. In the stories recounted in the Gospels, Pilate is portrayed as hesitant to condemn Jesus to death. It is believed that Pilate eventually converted to Christianity. He is honored as a martyr and a saint, a belief shared historically by the Coptic Church. They celebrate him with a feast day on June 19th or 25th. Before Pilate issued the order for Jesus' execution, he was brought before Caiaphas, the high priest who orchestrated a biased trial against him. This trial took place in front of a gathering of religious leaders, including the teachers of the law and elders. Amidst this, one of Jesus' disciples, Peter, followed from a distance. The Sanhedrin, a top Jewish council with 70 members, mainly composed of Sadducees, Pharisees, and priests, along with their leader, the high priest, were on a mission. They aimed to find any evidence of false evidence against Jesus, desperate to condemn him to death. But despite their relentless search, they came up empty-handed. Eventually, two individuals stepped forward, accusing Jesus of threatening to demolish the temple. This accusation arose from a statement Jesus had made previously, claiming he could rebuild the temple in three days. However, this was likely a misinterpretation of his teachings about resurrection. Jesus had spoken metaphorically, referring to his own body as the temple, which would rise again in three days. And as the tension rose, Caiaphas, the high priest, directly confronted Jesus, demanding to know if he claimed to be the Messiah, the Son of God. In response, Jesus affirmed, deeply hinting at his divine nature and future glory. He prophesied that they would witness him seated at the right hand of God, coming with the clouds of heaven. De Nevertheless, I say unto you, hereafter shall you see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. A Caiaphas, a prominent figure in religious leadership, was not condemned what Jesus said as blasphemy. Blasphemy means speaking or acting in a way considered disrespectful to God, especially according to Jewish beliefs. When Jesus claimed to be God's Son, it was seen as insulting to God by the Jewish leaders. As a result, they found him guilty. Not only did they condemn him, but they also physically attacked him, spitting in his face and beating him. And the Jewish leaders had multiple reasons for wanting Jesus dead. Firstly, he openly challenged their authority, calling them hypocrites. Additionally, they disapproved of his social circle, as he associated them with sinners, including prostitutes and tax collectors, whom they viewed as morally impure. Moreover, Jesus defied their Sabbath laws by performing healings on that day. They also objected to his claims about himself, such as being the Son of God and the promised Savior, which they couldn't accept. After the leaders of the Jewish community have deemed Jesus guilty of a crime punishable by death, they must take him before Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor. Surprisingly, it appears that the Sanhedrin, the Jewish council, lacked the authority to carry out capital punishment at the time. Thus, they required the approval of Governor Pilate to proceed with Jesus' execution. Their accusations against Jesus were twofold. They claimed he was corrupting their people and urging them to refuse to pay taxes to Caesar. Moreover, they accused him of declaring himself as Christ, a king. However, it's important to note that Jesus never explicitly instructed people to withhold taxes from the Roman authorities. Number 2. Jesus' Encounter with Pilate and Herod 
Pilate turned to Jesus, his curiosity peaked, and asked, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus remained composed, acknowledging Pilate's words, yet subtly hinting that the label wasn't of his own making. Instead of engaging in a direct response, Jesus chose not to argue with Pilate. Unlike with the Sanhedrin, debating with Pilate seemed futile. Pilate's interest lay not in the truth Jesus preached, but in the political implications. Thus, he declared to the chief priests and the crowd that Jesus had committed no wrongdoing, finding no grounds for crucifixion under Roman law. From the Roman viewpoint, Jesus stood innocent, devoid of any legitimate charges. Pilate, seeking a way out of the situation, then inquired if Jesus hailed from Galilee. Realizing Herod's jurisdiction over the region, he sent Jesus to Herod Antipas, who held sway over Galilee during that era. Herod Antipas, son of the famed Herod the Great, held authority from 4 BC to 39 AD. However, his power in Jerusalem was limited compared to his father and brother, who once ruled there. He might have had some property in Jerusalem, but it's unlikely he was there for religious reasons, since he wasn't particularly known for being religious. Even though his presence in Jerusalem could have made him look good, many people in Galilee might have known about it and possibly even supported him. The Bible tells us that when King Herod finally met Jesus, he was really happy because he had been wanting to meet him for a long time. Herod had heard a lot about Jesus and was excited to see some of the miracles he was said to perform. But when Herod tried to talk to Jesus, Jesus didn't say anything, which made Herod pretty frustrated. Meanwhile, the religious leaders kept on accusing Jesus strongly. The whole thing was kind of strange. Herod knew about Jesus and what he was doing in Galilee because he was worried about his safety and had a pretty good spy network. Before, Herod thought of John the Baptist as a danger, especially after John spoke out against him marrying Herodias. Herod wasn't sensitive to morals, but he knew that many people in Galilee didn't like his marriage for moral and political reasons. But Herod never did anything bad to Jesus, even though some Pharisees told Jesus that Herod wanted to kill him. Herod was only curious about Jesus and not interested in religion. Because Herod wasn't truly interested, Jesus didn't bother answering his questions. Herod and his people made fun of Jesus and treated him badly, even dressing him up in fancy clothes before sending him back to Pilate. Jesus had to appear before Herod Antipas, the ruler of Galilee and Perea. Herod was interested in Jesus' fame and hoped to see him do a miracle. But instead, Jesus didn't say anything and showed he didn't care about Herod's interest. Feeling disrespected because Jesus seemed not to care about him, Herod's dislike turned into strong dislike, making him treat Jesus with disrespect and teasing. Trying to make Jesus look small, Herod told his soldiers to dress Jesus in fancy clothes, mockingly admitting that he might think he was a king. This rude act wasn't just about making fun of Jesus, it was also about showing off Herod's power and showing that he was better than Jesus. It was a careful move to keep his reputation in control, especially when faced with someone who seemed dangerous. Additionally, the relationship between Herod and Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor of Judea, was complicated. Even though they didn't get along at first, having to deal with Jesus brought them closer together unexpectedly. Pilate's choice to punish Jesus, even though he didn't do anything wrong, shows the pressure he was under from Jewish leaders and the tense situation in Jerusalem during Passover. Pilate was focused on keeping everything in order and stable. But when it came down to it, he cared more about what was politically convenient than what was fair. So even though Jesus hadn't done anything wrong, Pilate still let him be treated unfairly. Interestingly, there was a hidden custom that was conducted in the Passover festival in Rome. Number 3. The Trial of Faith in Ancient Rome During the Passover festival, there was a fascinating custom where the governor pardoned one prisoner chosen by the people. This governor, Pilate, found himself in a difficult situation. He had to choose between two men, Barabbas, known for causing trouble, and Jesus Christ, whom some believed to be the chosen one. Pilate sensed that jealousy played a role in bringing Jesus before him. So Pilate turned to the crowd and asked them a crucial question. Who should I release? Barabbas or Jesus? Also called the Messiah. This moment is captured in the Gospel of Matthew, where Pilate, the judge, grapples with a perplexing dilemma. Adding to the tension, Pilate's wife had a troubling dream that convinced her of Jesus' innocence. 
she urgently warned her husband against condemning him. Despite this, Pilate's decision failed to satisfy the high priests and elders. They were determined not only to protect their reputation, but also to see Jesus executed. Their intense desire to spill Jesus' blood led them to gather a small mob to their side, creating a chaotic scene for the trial. This gripping tale paints a vivid picture of the political and religious tensions of the time, with Pilate caught in the middle of it all. During all the confusion and uproar, something unexpected happened. The leaders and the crowd, in a surprising turn of events, pleaded for the release of Barabbas, a known criminal who had committed serious crimes like murder. And this raises a puzzling question. Why would Pilate even think about letting a guilty man like Barabbas go? And what made the chief priests and elders who were supposed to uphold justice demand Barabbas' freedom while pushing for Jesus' condemnation? Pilate, confused by this strange request, asked the crowd again. But instead of reconsidering, they shouted even louder, demanding that Jesus be put to death by crucifixion. This was the first time crucifixion was explicitly brought up during the trials. Pilate, troubled by their insistence, questioned why they were so adamant. He stated that he found no fault in Jesus deserving such a punishment. He suggested a lighter punishment for Jesus, emphasizing his innocence, which was a central theme in Jesus' teachings. However, the crowd's uproar only grew louder, insisting on Jesus' crucifixion until Pilate had no choice but to give in to their demands. To show that he wasn't responsible for what happened to Jesus, Pilate made a big show of washing his hands in front of everyone. Then he let Barabbas, a guy in jail for causing trouble and killing people, go free just like the crowd wanted. Meanwhile, Jesus was handed over to them. But was Jesus guilty of what the Jewish leaders said? They accused him of breaking their religious rules, like healing people on the day they were supposed to rest. Whenever Jesus went to the synagogue, the Pharisees and law experts were always watching him closely, hoping he'd mess up. They were waiting for him to heal someone on the day of rest, so they could catch him. They asked him, is it okay to heal on the Sabbath, trying to trick him into admitting he did something wrong. In some stories, like those in Mark and Luke, Jesus starts a deep conversation by asking if it's right to heal on the Sabbath. During that time, he says, there was a big debate among Jewish religious leaders about certain rules. But in Matthew's story about Jesus, he tells it in such a captivating way, making it easy for everyone to understand. Jesus doesn't just talk straight. He paints a picture that sticks in people's minds. He describes a scene where a sheep falls into a hole on the day of rest, making his listeners imagine themselves in that situation, wondering if they would help the poor animal. Jesus isn't just talking about sheep, though. He's saying that helping others is more important than following rules strictly. He wants people to see that being kind is what matters, even if it means breaking some religious rules. And to prove his point even more, Jesus does something incredible. He heals a man's hand that was all withered up, making it strong and healthy again. But instead of everyone cheering for him, he, the religious leaders called the Pharisees, got mad. They don't like Jesus because he challenges their authority and does things they don't understand. Their anger and dislike toward Jesus grow even stronger because he doesn't follow their strict rules about resting on the Sabbath day. Things get intense when the Pharisees, who are Jewish leaders, team up with the Herodians, a group of people who support King Herod, to make a plan against Jesus. It's like a surprising and not-so-good partnership forming just to bring Jesus down. Now, many stories have been told about healings that occurred on the Sabbath, but one such healings particularly stood out. Number 4. The Sabbath Healing The stories in the Gospels tell people about times when Jesus healed people on the Sabbath, which was a special day for rest and worship. When Jesus healed on these days, it often caused arguments with the religious leaders. However, there's one story in Luke where Jesus heals someone on the Sabbath without any confrontation mentioned. This time it happened in a private home, not in a public place like a synagogue. Jesus knew the rules the Pharisees had about the Sabbath, so why did he choose to heal on that day? When Jesus healed on the Sabbath, he wasn't breaking God's law. He was going against how the Pharisees understood and followed the law. In the Bible, Matthew chapter 5 verse 17 tells us that Jesus didn't come to get rid of the law, but to fulfill it. 
The main reason Jesus healed on the Sabbath was that people needed his help. By healing on that day, Jesus was also showing how the Pharisees were being hypocritical in their religious practices. He wanted to teach them and others that showing love and compassion should always come first, even if it meant breaking some of the rules that people had made up. In three separate instances, Jesus encountered opposition when his acts of healing led to debates. Jesus pointed out how the Jews would tend to their animals on the Sabbath, a practice accepted by the Pharisees in their agricultural society. And he highlighted the irony of their willingness to work for the sake of animals while questioning their reluctance to extend the same compassion to a fellow human being. The Jesus illustrated this by asking whether they would not, on the Sabbath, untie their ox or donkey to lead it to water. As described in Luke chapter 13, verse 15, the Lord answered him, oh, You hypocrites! Doesn't each of you on the Sabbath untie your ox or donkey from the stall and lead it out to give it water? He exposed their double standard, the criticizing their refusal to offer aid to a daughter of Abraham. As noted in verse 16, then should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has kept bound for 18 long years, be set free on the Sabbath day from what bound her? Moreover, Jesus' actions challenged the religious leader's interpretation of Sabbath laws. At he posed a crucial question. Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to destroy it? By healing on the Sabbath, Jesus confronted the leaders with the essence of morality and compassion. But their silence in response to his questions spoke volumes, indicating their inability or unwillingness to acknowledge the righteousness of doing good, even on the Sabbath. Jesus' healing acts served as a clear demonstration that prioritizing kindness and preserving life transcends any rigid adherence to Sabbath regulations. In contrast, using Sabbath rules as a pretext for harm or cruelty was shown to be a distortion of divine law. Jesus often healed on the Sabbath to show everyone why God set aside that day as a time to rest. The Sabbath wasn't just about giving praise to God, it was also meant to help people. In the book of Mark, it says that the Sabbath was made to benefit humans, not the other way around. It was a chance for people to recover after a busy week and to shift their attention away from their daily tasks and towards God. When Jesus healed on the Sabbath, it was in line with what God intended for that day. This story reminds us that sometimes our stubbornness can lead us away from what's truly important. It's a good lesson for people to regularly check their beliefs and make sure they match up with what the Bible says. <laughs> Interestingly, a lot of accusations were levied against Jesus by the Romans, as they were never able to comprehend the deeper meanings behind his words and actions. Number 5. Jesus' Radical Message of Redemption And Jesus faced an accusation that he claimed he could destroy the temple and rebuild it within three days. This accusation carried serious weight because tampering with the sacred temple was considered blasphemy, punishable by death. It would also expose him as a fraud. However, Jesus' statement had a deeper meaning. Throughout the Gospels, he repeatedly spoke about his impending death and resurrection. He understood his divine mission, which was not about overthrowing earthly powers like the Romans, but about fulfilling a higher purpose. His disciples, however, had different expectations. They believed Jesus to be the promised Messiah who would establish an earthly kingdom, restoring the throne of King David in Jerusalem. Yet Jesus challenged their understanding. He would indeed reign as the promised Messiah, but his path to kingship was through sacrifice, not through violence. As for the significance of Jesus eating with sinners, it was a deliberate act to demonstrate his mission. After calling Matthew to follow him, Jesus shared a meal with many tax collectors and sinners at Matthew's house. This act symbolized Jesus' message of redemption and inclusion. It showed that he came not for the righteous, but for those who recognized their need for spiritual healing. In essence, it underscored the core of Jesus' teachings, love, forgiveness, and acceptance for all. Matthew, once a tax collector, surrounded himself with sinners who had become his friends and acquaintances. They were now drawn to Jesus, and Matthew desired to introduce them to him. However, the scribes and Pharisees who held disdain for tax collectors voiced their complaints. But despite this, Jesus continued to spend time with these sinners, aligning perfectly with his mission to seek and save the lost.
In the time of Jesus, rabbis and spiritual leaders held significant respect in Jewish society, particularly the Pharisees, known for their strict adherence to the law and tradition. They were honored as paragons of righteousness, with almost everyone looking up to them. Yet they distanced themselves from those they deemed as sinners, those who didn't adhere to their strict rules. It was unheard of for religious leaders of Jesus' time to associate with tax collectors, who were infamous for their corruption and collaboration with the despised Romans. However, Jesus deliberately chose to dine with sinners, emphasizing the availability of repentance and forgiveness. And as Jesus' ministry expanded, so did his popularity among society's outcasts, offering them hope and inclusion in a way that was previously unimaginable. Once upon a time, when Matthew became a close companion of Jesus, Jesus naturally started spending more time with the outcasts of society. It was only expected that Jesus would mingle with tax collectors and sinners, because, as mentioned in Mark chapter 21, verse 17, he came, not for the righteous, but for the sinners. Whole reason Jesus came to earth, the whole reason he died on the cross was not for good people, mate. It was not for perfect people. Jesus came for sinners. Jesus knew that to reach those who were lost, he needed to connect with them somehow. During a feast at Matthew's house, Jesus shattered societal norms and criticized the Pharisees' rigid rules for achieving righteousness. By dining with sinners, Jesus demonstrated that he cared more about people's inner selves than their societal status. While the Pharisees judged others based on their past actions, Jesus saw their spiritual needs. Throughout his ministry, Jesus consistently reached out to those who needed him. He surprised his disciples by engaging in conversation with a Samaritan woman, forgiving an immoral woman, and assisting a Syrophoenician woman. He even touched a leper and visited the home of Zacchaeus, a tax collector, demonstrating his willingness to embrace the marginalized. Time and again, Jesus showed compassion towards the untouchable and expressed love for those who were deemed unlovable. His actions exemplified his belief in looking beyond cultural boundaries and recognizing the humanity in everyone. But Jesus rose beyond customs and culture and was all about compassion. Number 6. The Compassionate Savior Jesus came to rescue people who had done wrong. It didn't matter to him if some people disapproved because their customs or culture said so. What mattered was saving souls, something so important it couldn't be overlooked. In John chapter 3, verse 17, it's mentioned that God didn't send Jesus to point fingers at everyone's mistakes, but to rescue them from those mistakes. Jesus was all about compassion, always looking out for others and sharing the teachings of God. He wasn't afraid to mingle with those who were considered bad by society. He showed that everyone deserves kindness and understanding by spending time with them and sharing meals. This had a big impact on those labeled as sinners. They could see Jesus for who he truly was, a good person, close to God, and capable of extraordinary things. His miracles were proof of his goodness, and his genuine care for others was clear to see. Jesus didn't care much for society's rules about who he should associate with. He was like a caring shepherd, searching for anyone who needed help, no matter where they were or what they'd done. When Matthew threw a party, Jesus gladly joined in. It was a perfect chance for him to spread the word about God's love to those who needed it most. And he faced harsh criticism from the rigid rule followers of his time, but he didn't let their disapproval get to him. Unlike the Pharisees, who demanded people change before accepting them, he welcomed everyone as they were. He reached out to them, meeting them in their circumstances, and showed them kindness and understanding. In one captivating incident, where a woman was caught in adultery, he demonstrated love and forgiveness. Imagine Jesus was teaching in the temple, having just come from the Mount of Olives, where he likely spent time in prayer and reflection. Suddenly, a group of scribes and Pharisees barged in, disrupting his peaceful lesson. They brought a woman, accusing her of adultery, claiming they caught her red-handed. Their voices echoed off the ancient stone walls as they insisted that according to the law of Moses, she deserved to be stoned. Despite their persistent challenges, they instead of falling into their trap of legalism, Jesus reacted with remarkable calmness. He didn't engage in a verbal debate or rush to judgment. Instead, he quietly knelt on the dusty floor of the temple and began drawing in the sand, a simple yet profound gesture that captured the attention of everyone present. 
The tension in the air was palpable as they waited for his re response, wondering what this unconventional teacher would do next. He says that the person who hasn't done anything wrong should be the first to throw a stone at her. When he says this, the people who want to blame her and the others listening leave because they realize they're not perfect either. And so Jesus is left alone with the woman. He asks her if anyone has said she's guilty, and she says no. Jesus then tells her that he doesn't say she's guilty either, and advises her to live better from now on. The teachers of the law and religious leaders were trying to trick Jesus. In those days, if someone cheated on their partner, they could be killed by being hit with rocks. According to the rules written in Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 22, if a man is found lying with the wife of another man, both of them shall die, the man who lay with the woman, and the woman, so you shall purge the evil from Israel. If Jesus said the woman should go free, he might get in trouble for not following the law. But if he said she should be punished, he could get in trouble with the Roman government, because only they could decide to kill someone. This would also give the Jewish leaders a reason to complain about him. In this story, Jesus is presented with a moral dilemma that tests his wisdom and compassion. The crowd's eagerness to stone the woman reflects the harshness of ancient justice systems, where punishment was often severe and unforgiving. Jesus' response not only demonstrates his belief in forgiveness and redemption in this, but also challenges the hypocrisy of those who are quick to judge others while ignoring their flaws. Moreover, this event showcases Jesus' ability to navigate delicate political and legal situations. By neither condoning the woman's actions nor endorsing her punishment, Jesus sidesteps the trap set by both religious law and Roman authority. And his response transcends the narrow confines of legalism, and instead emphasizes the importance of mercy and understanding in human interactions. The Jewish leaders, known as the Pharisees and scribes, held significant religious authority in ancient Judea. They were experts in Jewish law and were often seen as moral authorities. However, their motives in bringing the adulterous woman to Jesus were questionable. Some historians suggest they may have been attempting to trap Jesus or test his adherence to Jewish law. The setting of this event is also intriguing. It took place in the temple area in Jerusalem, likely in the court of the Gentiles, where people from various backgrounds gathered. This public setting adds drama to the encounter, as Jesus is questioned in front of a diverse crowd, including both supporters and doubters. Additionally, the response of Jesus, stooping down and riding in the dust, has sparked much speculation and debate among scholars. While the exact meaning of his actions remains uncertain, some suggest that Jesus may have been referencing Old Testament passages related to judgment and forgiveness, further emphasizing the theme of justice and mercy. And Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor of Judea at the time, holds a key role in the crucifixion of Jesus. His decision to condemn Jesus to death underscores the political tension between the Roman authorities and Jewish religious leaders. Pilate's reluctance to intervene highlights the complexities of power dynamics and political expediency in the ancient world. Furthermore, the manner of Jesus' death crucifixion was a form of execution reserved for the most despised criminals and rebels in Roman society. It was a gruesome and painful method of punishment designed to inflict maximum pain and humiliation. Jesus willingly enduring such a fate underscores the depth of his sacrifice and commitment to his mission. What are your thoughts on Pontius Pilate's shocking letter on Jesus' death? Let us have your opinions in the comments below. And if you enjoyed watching this video, make sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel.